Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alessandro Fossati. I am director of the Zweka Projects in Venice. Uh, we are connected uh, with the exhibition space Squero Castello in Venice, adjacent to the Biennale, uh, in the, where the Tropicalia exhibition, official collateral event of this architectural Biennale, is being shown and hosted until the 24th of November. We are here with an incredible selection of speakers today. Uh, different professionals from a variety of fields which have explored the theme and addressed the issues of how we will live together. The theme set by Hashim Sarkis, the curator of this year's Biennale. We're very lucky to have Thomas Koldefi, the architect who was designed the Tropicalia Dome, and the commissioner and concept developer, the originator of the Tropicalia concept, Philippe Guerra. Um, we have a series of illustrious speakers with us today. Um, Philip Wilson, director of the Eckersley Callaghan Institute and engineering firm. Morgan Soronek from Novaxia. Thierry Bier and Alan Kirsch from Elitis. And Olive Schutt from A01 Company. Yes, thank, yes, thank you, you everyone for, for being with us. us. Uh, today, today we are going, going to listen to, to, uh, uh, to listen, listen and discuss about fantastic projects that are real actions, actions uh, related to our topic, which is building, building for a sustainable future. The first, the first one, one we're going to talk, talk about is uh, Tropicalia, Tropicalia uh, Green, Green Dome, Dome presented uh, by Cedric Guerin, president, president of uh, Tropicalia, Tropicalia who is sitting here, here with me. me. Uh, we're we're going to listen to Philip Wilson uh, from, from Eccleston O'Callaghan, who is also an engineer, engineer of uh, the project of Tropicalia. He will, he will talk, talk about his approach on lightweight structure and materials. Uh, we, we have Morgan Skoranek from, from Novaxia. Uh, she, she will discuss about uh, investing in urban, urban recycling. recycling. Then, then we, we have Thierry Dev and, and Alan Kirsch. They, they will share their, their visions and actions in making positive energy buildings. We have, we have Oliver, Oliver Schutter, Schutter architect, architect with A01. He will share his not footprint houses. And uh, we will start with uh, a short presentation about the exhibition Tropicalia Materials Innovative Systems relating to the discussion uh, that we are happy to have uh, today. Hello, I'm Thomas Coldefi from Coldefi Architect. I'm pleased to welcome you at Tropicella show for the Venice Biennale collateral event. The spirit of the show is about Tropicalia, 20,000 square meter dome. It's about understanding through architecture, technology and design how we can better understand the fragility of our ecosystems. Tropicalia will be located on the Opal Coast, north part of France. Uh, we have a bubble-like dome which will reconnect visitors to plants, animals, um, in a region where climate is pretty often pretty harsh. Tropicalia will not just be a destination or a stopover, but it's really a place open to local community all year long and will integrate like cultural programs, uh, learning, participating to the, to the region dynamic of a, a new ecosystem. It will be a place of exchange, a place of sharing, accessible to, uh, to many, many people. So the project is, uh, is both a dome, an experience, an uh, immersive experience. So in order to uh, bring this project to life, we need it to define the right proportions. And it took many years actually to work with uh, our commissioner, with uh, Dr. Cedric Guérin, uh, a veterinary, which is, who is a very sensitive and close to uh, the evolution of uh, spaces and the danger of the spaces. So he wanted to uh, conceive a space that is both a space for exploration but also uh, a place where uh, people can come, study, uh, stay. So we will have residences, we will have auditorium. The 
aim of the project was uh, also to provide a totally peaceful experience uh, so that uh, we define a universe that is very calm, uh, a place of observation. So when we started studies almost uh, 10 years ago, uh, we defined that uh, this place should be not in the middle of the city, but some place at the outskirts of the city so that we can set uh, really the atmosphere and uh, the experience that is uh, uh, that is requested in order to uh, promote this integration and of course in order to uh, provide maximum uh, light and natural light into the space uh, we created this uh, very translucent uh, uh, capsule that is uh, providing the shelter for this ecosystem uh, so that's why the space is uh, a combination of uh, a ring uh, of functions and a central space that is very free and very simple Once the research was set, we uh, needed to transform uh, this program into a piece of architecture. That's what we call uh, almost going from uh, biomorphism to architecture. The dimension that has been decided was to go on a, a shape of uh, an ellipse, which is uh, the size is around 150 meter by uh, 200 meter, and it's rising at 32 meter high without intermediate uh, support. So any support, any vertical support leaving the interior of the building and the greenhouse free of any supporting structure. So in the end, the, the system and the structural grid is, is very simple. We have uh, an air chamber where we capture the, the heat from the sun and from this uh, air chamber, we will send this heat into um, a tank, a tank which is at the bottom of the building. This tank will be almost like a, a natural radiator for the entire building and also have some extra heat that we will provide for the, you know, the surrounding equipment, the surrounding uh, future business. So in the end, the uh, promotion of uh, Tropicalia is more than a building, it's something that is serving another purpose, is uh, to provide an architecture that is uh, something else, something that is open to uh, work with the neighbors. So Tropicalia will be a positive energy building. It will be also more than that, it will be an energy producer. So it goes beyond the idea of uh, a building that is just a building. It's a building that is also playing a role for its surrounding community. Uh, it's a place of uh, preservation, it's a place of education, but it's a place also of innovation. So this was really a spectacular introduction into the world of Tropicalia. And as we said today, we're very lucky uh, to have Mr. Guerra with us, which is the mind and the inspiration behind this project. So really today we can uh, ask the questions and uh, explore where did it start, the dream, and all that it takes from a concept, from an idea, a vision, to to, to coming into, into, into reality and uh, with the relationship with Thomas. Yes, uh, thanks uh, Alexandro, thanks for this meeting today to Venice. Um, we are very lucky uh, to present uh, Tropicalia uh, in, uh, in Venice. And so yes, I'm, uh, the, I'm the project manager of this, uh, this concept. I have um, imaginated this uh, tropical greenhouse about six, six years ago when I met Thomas, Thomas Coldefi, Coldefi, uh, to uh, Lille. And um, I, um, I, I, at this time, I was, I was alone um, when, uh, because I, I was only a, a, vet practitioner, a veterinary pra practitioner. And uh, I have the yes, idea to, um, uh, to associate uh, my patients about tropical uh, environment uh, with my uh, profession. And so the concept began in my, in my mind. And um, I need, at this time, um, an architect uh, able uh, to be able to uh, to design this uh, specific greenhouse, and uh, it was a, a, real, a real challenge because uh, it's difficult today to uh, to build um, uh, the biggest tropical greenhouse in the world, and um, but with an ecological um, view, uh, the aim the aim of the project is really um, a combination uh, between energy and um, 
experience immersive experiences. And that's uh, very important for us. Yes. We have a little presentation. Yes, yes. So I, I will uh, show you some uh, slides for to present the project. So now, um, just for uh, uh, to present the project, the Tropicala project, project is um, uh, located, um, will be located uh, in north of France um, on the, the Côte d'Opal. Uh, it's near Le Touquet. Um, it's a touristic uh, zone. Um, we are uh, a place in ideal, ideal places because we are um, near England, um, near Belgium, and uh, at north of Paris, and uh, a lot of people um, go uh, in our country for tourism, and it's why. It, so it it will be uh, natural to uh, to um, to put Tropicalia uh, at this uh, at this place. Um, here we have a, a video. Uh, we start uh, the, the video now for to uh, it's it's a synthesis. Um, you, yes. And now we are at the top of the high mountain, and you, you can see that um, the, um, the volume of this greenhouse is uh, really, really uh, big. And uh, we, you can see that we have a tropical um, system with um, a lot of places. Um, so it's, uh, it's this, um, this uh, film is to, uh, to show how the experience uh, for the, the visitor will be uh, a tropical area, and uh, here we have. Uh, um, uh, it's for for uh, to show the concept uh, of tropical area, the energy concept. It's very important for us. Uh, we have a specific label uh, in the, um, in our country, uh, Reef Reef Three label. It's a label to show uh, how we can um, um, uh, to be uh, an ecological uh, greenhouse because we um, we collect the heat. Um, of the uh, of the tropical effect for to um, transfer the calorie into water and after that we we have so uh, hot water and we can re um, utilize reutilize the um, this, this energy for to um, uh, put in the greenhouse for to con man um, Maintenir, uh, to, keep, to, uh, maintain. to maintain uh, the climate in, into the greenhouse. And so uh, at this time, we know, we know we, that we are um, at the uh, uh, equilibri, uh, um, energy, um, equilibrage, uh, autonomy, autonomy, energy, during seven, uh, seven months uh, all, uh, in, the, in the year. And um, we, we think that with Tropicala, we will be able to um, to put this technology outside um, of the of the of the greenhouse, um, for example, in the, in the future, for in the streets or other places, um, because we have uh, the technology for it. And the um, the aim the aim of the project is to develop a foundation, um, because we uh, we want to. Uh, um, find some project or to, uh, to keep some project, uh, ecological project, and the foundation is, uh, is uh, also for, for this. And a um, few, few months ago, we, are, we, we was um, in Ecuador uh, for to meet um, uh, a, a butterfly keeper, and uh, he, uh, he raised some butterflies, many butterflies, uh, all year long. And uh, this activity um, of the, the breeding butterflies uh, protects uh, the, the tropical forest because uh, we, we need uh, some forest to, to raise some butterflies. And this activity is essential uh, in this country. And, tro and tropical air will buy some chrysalids, um, uh, to, for example, in Ecuador. And we know that today it's uh, for the protection uh, of, the, of the forest is very important. And uh, we, um, uh, at this time, we, um, we speak uh, with uh, uh, another ONG, uh, for uh, example, to uh, reforest. Uh, and in this, uh, in this uh, slide, it's to, um, to re-put some mangrove 
um, in, the, in the desert zone. And uh, it's, it's very important to, um, uh, with Tropicalia to develop this, or this sort of project. And you can, um, if you want some more information, you can visit our website uh, for, to, uh, for more, explic uh, for more uh, details of this project. Maybe, Maybe Cedric, uh, we can speak, speak a little bit about uh, this uh, really, really big challenge. Um, and when you talk about it, it looks like it's simple, but starting uh, many years ago, um, trying to promote nature awareness and uh, making it more uh, general so that people from your uh, native region could come and discover uh, this world in order to become more uh, aware and also promote uh, uh, research. It has to, um, we had to together, I guess, through architecture, but also through uh, convictions uh, to prove uh, by facts that this building was actually uh, setting new standards in terms of uh, innovation. Uh, because, of course, when we want to do kind of a big infrastructure as a piece of architecture, it raises the question about uh, carbon, fo carbon footprint and uh, the impact on the environment. So we, we, when Cedric came to the office, we had to uh, combine all uh, those uh, dreams and in the same time uh, prove that uh, this building would become uh, a neutral carbon uh, building. Uh, and we did that by uh, using local resources and very, um, uh, very kind of a down-to-earth ideas, like why don't we use the sun that is there to provide the entire energy uh, we have also, we had to, to bring as much as uh, transparency and light into the space so that it becomes really uh, very sensitive and very, uh, I mean, uh, very positive environment. So for that we had to uh, design a structure that was uh, able to support uh, this dome. Uh, and also, again, like you just, you just said, uh, bring all the solar energy into a tank of water so that the, the, the building actually is not acting only to serve as a program in itself for tourism or for people uh, to come, but also to become a kind of a giant uh, energy collector for the community. Uh, so it it's opens this discussion about uh, what do we do uh, tomorrow with our building and large infrastructure. Uh, we, 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 we were very excited about this idea that a building can be productive. I think it's, it's something that is uh, also part of the talk today about the sustainable revolution. And th this building will be a proof uh, as a first example of uh, true fact that actu actually you can build an environment and actually uh, build with the, the natural resources, uh, which I think yes. is something that we, we will be really excited to share when, when it's over. Um, yes, it's true. Um, the, at the beginning, uh, the most important, thi important thing is to isolate um, our structure, our greenhouse, because um, uh, before you put some heat inside, you, uh, we must um, uh, try some solution for um, uh, ag against the, uh, the heat deperdition. So uh, when you see the, the greenhouse, you, you, you can see that um, we are a little bit in, in the ground. So uh, at the outside, in the peripheric, peripheric um, uh, side of the greenhouse, uh, you can see um, uh, some, uh, small uh, so, some small hill, and um, we, we know uh, that uh, it's very isolated because uh, the ground is very uh, um, uh, isolated, the system. And when you see the dome, uh, it's, uh, it's not a simple dome, it's a double dome. And it's important to see that because uh, you have uh, uh, outside the dome uh, some pillows, um, about one meters, and uh, that uh, Everybody says that uh, knows that um, hair is a very um, uh, isolated system, and after that you have uh, um, the, archi the, the archi architecture uh, of the of the dome, and a simple layer um, just uh, just uh, um, at the surface inside the surface, and so we have about two meters, two meters point five of um, of air system, and uh, so we are extremely iso isolated. And that's the first, uh, the first, um, um, it's very important at the first time. And after that, we have uh, developed a solution for to recycle 
uh, recycling, hair, recycling. Uh, recycling hair, hair of the um, heat, heat uh, hair inside the greenhouse and to stock um, the energy in water. And this, uh, this uh, technology, um, we think that it, uh, it's important in the future because at this time we know that we can uh, export um, more energy than we produce uh, by, by sun. Um, for example, we, can, we, we will be able to, um, to give about uh, 2,000 uh, megawatts uh, by hour for a year uh, to the hospital. Um, and it's very important we, we, we can um, put some heat water, hot water to the hospital. And its uh, tropical project is a real uh, a combination for uh, ecological tourism with uh, um, uh, dimen ecological energy dimension. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, gentlemen. This is, uh, this is the incredible uh, new frontier where technology, sustainability, architecture all meet really uh, the, the everyday people. So this structure is accessible also, we must say. It's made to be accessed by children, students. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, it's not an ivory tower. It's, exactly. it's really meant uh, to be openly accessed for education. It's a platform research. for research and education yeah. and science. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's absolutely accessible to everybody. So this is also a very important aspect. And I think uh, it's a commendable project. And uh, it's been many years in the making. And it deserves all the attention uh, from the international community. And so thank you for participating. Also because we're going to um, yeah, deliver the project in 2024, uh, 24. 24, which is coming soon. So, so fraught with challenges from concept to development into, into reality. This is with the themes that we are, we are staying close to. Um, let us move swiftly along. Thank you, gentlemen. Our next speaker is Philip Wilson. Director of Accuracy O'Callaghan. Uh, Philip runs Accuracy O'Callaghan Paris Studio. He has over 25 years of experience as a structural and facade engineer, working in the UK and Japan before moving to France in 2004. He was director of Director Spatial, engineering consulting firm founded in Paris, and there was McFarland Partners Structure Design Group in Tokyo. Hello, Philip. How are you? Yeah, great. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. It's always nice to hear more and more about the project and find out new, new ideas that, uh, that grow. Um, I'm happy to share my screen. That's the, that's the idea here. There's a presentation which is ready to go. Um, can everybody see that from your end? Yes. Hopefully that should, that should be clear now. So as you pointed out, I mean, our role <clears throat> was as engineers to, um, to find a solution that was best adapted to, um, to the challenge really um, for the structure and the, uh, and the cladding, the, this translucent cladding, which, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, so there's, there's five themes which I've wanted to, to point out for this talk. Um, to start with, the, we had to define the, um, the geometry um, obviously, as engineers, uh, we had to, to give some quantification. Um, and we based this on a torus um, with uh, a length of 215 for its, for its principal radius and a height radius of 135 meters. Um, so that um, described the, the geometry and, and gave us some, um, some resolution for, for, for having the, the dome surface. Um, with a, with a height and a span to rise ratio of 6.75 and a span to depth of, of 41. Um, and the next thing was this inspiration um, of, of, of Thomas Colophy um, about the um, sinusoidal form, um, which has you know, a nature a reference um, from the, the peaks and the troughs um, geographically. And so we were, as engineers, attached to this form and we knew this was a key, a key item that we had to, 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 to follow um, and find a way of, of deviating these, these trusses um, in the best way that we could and in the most intelligent way to give the, uh, the final rendering 
that was so close to, uh, to Thomas Cordofi and, and the client. Um, what, what we heard before about was this, this cavity system, uh, which um, is about two meters and at the lowest point rises up to, to three meters. So we had a series of peaks and troughs um, which facilitated the, the, the surface um, runoff. Um, and with those peaks and troughs, as engineers, we had to play with a geometrical solution for the, um, the primary trusses and the secondaries. So what we did was to construct a series of, of primary trusses spanning the full length, um, stabilizing these trusses um, in the transversal direction, and then infilling these trusses with much smaller secondary trusses, um, which gives the, the troughs um, which is the lower, the lower point of the um, of the structure. Now, after we had the, the more specific geometry, we had the troughs. Our our key role, I think, the one that kind of um, justified all the work and, and the input that we had, was to optimize optimize here for for the lightest possible steelwork structure. Now, clearly, the lightest steelwork structure has the lightest and the lowest carbon footprint. Um, so that was our challenge. Now we went through lots and lots of deviations, um, changing the, 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 the spacing of these trusses, um, just changing the height of the trusses, the number of elements, you would think the number of elements um, would come up with the lighter structure, but we need to make sure that those elements don't become too big in size and too heavy themselves. So all that is, is optimized um, using software, which is clearly available now um, in the way of Rhinosaurus, scripting um, with Grasshopper, and following um, engineering rules of deflection and stress. So after about 18 models, or perhaps even more models, um, we came to our final preferred solution and the most optimal solution. Now those options um, primarily were driven by a, a triangular truss system, or at the time it was a, a planar truss system. Um, and both of those were investigated for that optimization um, technique. And so where, where we came to um, was that both those options gave a, uh, a very lightweight structure, the most lightweight at about 74 kilograms per meter squared um, solution. Um, do bear in mind that the overall surface is, is 22,000 meters squared. Um, and that positioned us in relation to some very well-known projects um, very favorably, um, again, depending on the, the spans that you have. Um, but we were certainly uh, performing um, extremely well um, as a benchmark against other structures. So eventually we, 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 we achieved our, our structural uh, principles. Um, another, not so much an optimization, but certainly a guideline um, was that our chosen cladding solution was ETFE. Um, and again, an optimization, or let's say a, a semi-optimization in terms of um, spanning widths or, or spans, the span range for the ETFE, um, and trying to find some repetition as much as possible um, in, the, in the spans of the ETFE. Now, why did we use ETFE? Clearly, it's, it's the lightest possible um, cladding um, uh, Structure cladding um, that you can have to the to the structure. Um, I mean, its weight is uh, is literally um, as light as you will ever have, um, and it's principally um, two two sheets of, of membrane filled with air um, and air cushions. We have a, a good thermal performance. Um, we have cushions, um, air cushions on the outside um, that have a, a screen printed coating. Again, there's a balance to be made between. Um, how much of an opaque coating you have um, against the amount of solar factor and light transmission. But very early on, it was decided that ETFE was the, uh, the ideal solution. Technically, we had to integrate those details um, into the steelwork structure um, in the neatest possible way. Um, and that took a bit of time. Um, and then again, the idea of, of, of what's the rationality between an ETFE, ETFE panel that's having to fit to these sinusoidal forms, or perhaps a more straightforward um, ETFE panel 
uh, which has a more developable, developable geometry and a much simpler geometry. So making that comparison and um, making decisions on that basis. Now, finally, um, this cavity construction was something that interested us very, very much. Um, as you saw previously, we have the air cushions on, on, to the outside, um, and then we have a single membrane to the inside. Um, so we, we followed that with uh, a, a matching pattern of, 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 of membrane and cushions, so 138 cushions um, to the top surface, easily accessible um, for maintenance. Um, with six uh, motors that are running to basically uh, pump the air. Uh, so again, that's 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 um, using the minimum minimal amount of mechanical equipment required. Um, and then the the lower membrane, which matches um, the upper cushions, which again is divided into 133 um, separate segments. And again, that cavity construction was was included into the part of the, um, the effect of the, the steelwork structure in itself. Um, evidently, the lightweight nature of the steelwork structure, um, it still had a, a presence in terms of the shading. And we can see here how the, uh, the solar radiation, the annual radiation on the ground was significantly minimized um, simply by the, um, the, the the structure itself blocking out any of the sun's rays, which again was um, incorporated into the uh, into the final analysis um, by the ME engineer. So that's 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 my my standpoint here, and that's uh, how we, uh, we we fed into the, um, the structural side. I hope that was of interest. Uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, that was that that was really. Uh, the heart of the of the structure and the dome, all the technology which goes behind it, is is really an integral uh, part of uh, of the structure. Uh, we are moving on to our next speaker, uh, Morgan Skorneck from the Novaxia Group. Uh, Novaxia is an investment company specialized in urban recycling, born from the fusion of real estate savings. Novaxa combines two areas of expertise to serve its investors, the management of real estate savings and the development of urban projects. Novaxia develops innovative real estate funds and projects that meet the challenges of sustainable cities by aligning everyone's interests. At first, the company with the mission is real estate sector. Novaxia aims to develop investment in urban recycling for the benefit of the greater good. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Morgan. Uh, nice to see you and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity um, to uh, share with you a few insights uh, of what Novaxia does uh, through one of our iconic assets uh, developed with Coldifi, which is uh, the Wonder Building in Bagnolet. So I will share my screen. Okay, great. So let's go. So, uh, First, let's talk about some urban facts. Can I? Yeah. Uh, so uh, there is a steady polarization uh, of the Parisian metropolis between the west and the east, and which leads to several fractures uh, that have strong negative impact uh, on the populations. Uh, a social fracture, because you know that, well, 22% of the executives lives actually uh, in the West uh, versus 7% uh, in the East. Uh, there is, of course, an inequality of income between local communities. Um, there is some employment and residence imbalance because uh, most of the offices are located in the West part of Paris, uh, whereas the residential part is mostly located on the East. And of course, it makes uh, longer commutes to work. So there are there are some uh, uh, some issues that 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 must be addressed. And at Novaxia, we believe in opportunities, and we fight the status quo. So, as a company, we have a purpose, uh, which is to develop and promote the investment um, in urban recycling with positive impact. And it's called in French uh, "entreprise à mission," uh, which would be a, a benefit corporation in the U.S. Uh, for those who are not uh, familiar with the. Um, the name. So 
Therefore, uh, we see uh, supporting the development of, the, uh, of a new economic pole in the east of Paris as an opportunity, uh, because the location is still what it is very close to Paris, the accessibility exists, and there is some attractiveness in terms of rents, because as you can see, it's, uh, uh, it goes uh, above 400 euros uh, when we talk about rental, uh, rental figures for offices in the West. Even when we talk with, about the central business district in, uh, in the 8th arrondissement of Paris, it goes above 750 euros per square meter. Whereas in the East, there are still some opportunities and attractive rents for, uh, for future headquarters. So, um, we see that the purchasing power, the arrival of the Grand Paris Express uh, and the, the, the potential development of the economic activity might be an opportunity for us. Yet, it's a bet to go to Bagnolet, and I would like to uh, highlight that. Uh, so this is the area on the left hand, and this is actually a Google image of the street uh, where, uh, where it's located, the Wonder Building. You, you can see the plot is where the cranes are, so it's, it's an old picture from, uh, uh, from Google. So um, the Wonder Building is fully in line with this approach of rebalancing uh, East and West offices, yet it's a bet on the future because the area you see is very urban, not very pedestrian friendly uh, with the interchange, the ring roads, um, but still we, we were quite pioneer at Novaxia by acquiring in 2014 and 2016, the two plots where you can see the cranes uh, to transform an old obsolete industrial site uh, in a large scale office project that will, be, will come uh, 2,700 people and contribute by uh, 135 million euro GDP uh, to the region. So it's a bet for an up and coming territory. We, we, we think that there are still opportunities because since 2014, Bagnolet has already changed a lot. Uh, in 2014, Orange, Orange, uh, Group Orange uh, moved in. Uh, first, it was Le Grand, also a big company, which is currently extending uh, its uh, headquarters in Bagnolet. And the site extension will be completed in 2024. And then the Twin Towers, uh, called Mercurial, changed hands. And its new investors obtain uh, a building permit in 2019 to fully renovate the towers into offices and hotels. And in March 2021, Bagnolet was chosen by the state. Uh, so we've been there since uh, uh, a few years now uh, to experiment what they call the Productive Neighborhoods Program launched by the Ministry of City. And the idea was to settle economic activity centers uh, in the heart of neighborhoods facing complicated social and economic uh, issues, okay? So alongside with public actors, uh, there are now several private real estate players who are also committing into the area and pulling buildings uh, out of the ground to give life to this new economic hub of Eastern Paris. So we're not the only ones now, uh, but we were one of the first to, 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 to believe in the potential of Bagnolet with, uh, with Col Défi. So now there is Giboire, Cofim, Vinci, Sopic, uh, Euro Equipment, Quartus, etc. There are several of them. But we will be the, 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 the first one and still have this pioneer, uh, pioneer spirit. So still, Bagnolet, of course, uh, doesn't aim to look like La Défense. No, not at all. And it's quite the opposite. They cultivate this uh, uh, kind of image of village uh, at the gate of Paris, like a, a new Brooklyn, if I can uh, and at the gate of Paris, actually, it has a lot, uh, a lot of potential because um, there is some attractiveness uh, right because of its location uh, next to Paris, perfectly accessible from the capital and the roundabout. And uh, it's a real crossroads of Eastern Paris and what we could call the, the Galloni hub uh, here uh, is at the heart, heart of the transportation network of exchanges and connection, um, highway, um, uh, Metro Line 3, 7 bus lines, uh, etc. serve the area. And at the end, it's already 10,000 employees that pass through uh, its business center every day, while uh, more than 500,000 overnight stays are recorded each year in, this, in, uh, in the hotels. So I said, 
I said before that the Wonder Building kind of epitomizes uh, the original positioning of, uh, of Novaxia. And one of our features uh, that, that we like is to actually temporarily uh, enable occupation of empty premises during the vacancy phase between acquisition and the launch of the, of the works. Uh, so we make uh, the, the premises available for free to local associations and the idea uh, is to, uh, the approach is known to as transitional urban development uh, or temporary urbanism. And it seeks to foster uh, a model of urban development uh, aligned with uh, use local resources and the needs of the residents. And well, that's what we did with the Wonder Building during 27 months uh, before the start of the construction works, uh, Novaxia uh, with a collective uh, of artists called Le Wonder which actually gave its name uh, to the building, um, uh, Occupy and brought life uh, to the place. So for them, for free during 27 months, it represents a total rent saving of 2.8 million euros. So it's 11 times uh, the budget of the collective. So they, they wouldn't have been able to do that uh, without our help. Um, there were um, uh, 30 33,000 visitors uh, that took, took part in the cultural events organized. So it, it was it was a huge success and uh, and for us a uh, real proud to open uh, open the building on the on the area and to increase uh, the cultural attendance in a city like Bagnolet. Uh, so uh, the reconstruction of the city on itself uh, by transforming obsolete uh, assets. Uh, that have become vacant uh, is is one of the solutions we see to, to all the challenges that we are facing today. Um, but this, this must be done uh, with combining uh, the best environmental standards and a reflection on uh, the uses of, of, of the assets. And, and that's what we've done with the Wonder Building. So you, you can see, and it's a, actually, I, I've always wondering if it, was, if it was a coincidence, the W shape of the facade or uh, that, uh, that fits perfectly its name as Wonder Building, uh, or it's a kind of a convergence of uh, an alignment of interest. So here you can see the facade on the ring road. So it has a, an amazing visibility. It's a, an iconic landmark of, architect, of architecture. Uh, so designed by our partner, uh, uh, Thomas Coldefi. Um, and, uh, and we try, uh, what we try to do here, it's, to, uh, uh, it's a mixed use construction of uh, wood and, uh, and concrete. Uh, actually, it's a so low carbon architecture because the wooden structure, uh, including the stairs, uh, allows to limit the consumption of concrete and thus reduce the, the carbon footprint and the consumption of sand during the, uh, during the construction works. Uh, the works are being done by the uh, Brig uh, that are doing an amazing work. We've just uh, finished three weeks ago the, uh, the, the structural works, and now we are starting uh, the, the, the facade part. Uh, so everything is going right. Up. Oh, sorry. And um, so it's a, it's, it's a kind of partnership model with concrete uh social social and social and economic impacts uh so during the construction site uh, we talk about uh, 1300 jobs uh, provided by the construction site uh i said 2700 jobs of employees uh going to uh, to the offices when it would be delivered and actually so making the territory attractive uh, because when you have two uh, 2700 daily workers of course uh, there are some uh, uh, benefits uh, for the whole area because they're going to spend uh, in restaurants, in uh, shops around, uh, etc. So I, I, I pass a few figures, I, I pass a few pictures so you can see. Um, we have something which is generous. Uh, we want it like uh, uh, fully in line with the new uh, way, ways of working after the COVID pandemics. So the, the ceiling is super high, it's full with light, it's uh, inspiring buildings, you have the, the stairs which are on the uh, 
almost on the outside to uh, to enhance the connection between all the levels. Um, the height goes up to. Yeah, I'm almost finished, so I will be perfectly on time. Uh, the the height goes to uh, three point uh, uh, fifty meters in the in the lobby, and then it's almost three meters high uh, in the other levels. Uh, so it's really a star, state of the art building uh, that will be delivered in uh, October two thousand twenty two. So uh, uh, in less than one year. So stay tuned for the opening event. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have this progression uh, from man and nature into urban space, urban space, offices, a form of uh, urban recyclage and reappropriating space, giving it back to the community, giving it to artists and from artists back into the workforce, but in the respect of emissions of energy efficiency through the use of technology of natural materials and wood. So there is a circular uh, approach to solving problems and there's a coherence and a consistency. Uh, our next speaker is Thierry Biev and Alan Kirsch from Elitis, uh, also involved in uh, energy positive buildings, but here we're dealing in residential, residential units. So please take us, uh, take us through your tour. Hello, let me just share my screen. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, Thierry. Hello, Alan. Yes. Hello. Hello, everyone. Many thanks. Many, many thanks uh, to you for, for your invitation. I'm Thierry Biev, president of, uh, and founder of Elitis Group. And I'm Alan Kirsch, uh, head of business development. Can you see our screen? Please uh, allow me to give a very uh, brief introduction on who and uh, what is Elitis. Elitis is a French building engineering consulting on the new model of a real estate development company. We have more than 25 years of experience, over 100 employees, and 2,500 projects throughout the last 10 years. Elitis is a pioneer in low carbon footprint on energy positive buildings and has structured its services around its two expertise areas, Elitis Solution our building engineering and consulting arm, assisting construction and building players. ATC Immobilier, our own real estate development arm, which develops energy positive buildings and net zero energy built towers. Here are a few project references. About our mission is to respond to today's major ecological and social issues by addressing the environmental challenges of the 21st century, such as fighting climate change and global warming, accelerating the energy transition and achieving carbon neutrality, lifting household purchasing power, improving health and quality of life, enhancing competitiveness of the construction industry and limiting urban sprawl by building upwards. All this while restoring friendly relations between ecology and economy. About our value, providing more brain power to create sustainable and low carbon solutions. Since we started the company, we have developed a particular DNA that has made us stronger and agile. This DNA is constant innovation. At Elitis, our engineers are like explorers. We first seek creativity and imagination before solving a problem. So our vision is very simple. We want to make energy positive buildings available to everyone by building a climate, climate change, a climate smart future, sorry, with green initiatives and smart design choices that have big impacts on our community. Like farm to table, we bring our energy efficient engineering know-how to our residents through our developments. In early 2020, LTS partnered and formed an exclusive supply project pipeline with Catella Residential Invest Management, setting out a plan to deliver a 2 billion investment program to build 
100 energy positive, resilient, future proof residential towers across Europe by 2030. The four SDG principles, good health and well being, affordable and clean energy, sustainable cities and communities, climate action. But first, let me explain what is energy positive. Energy positive is the energy of the future. Is a building that produces more energy than the residents consume and the building requires to operate. Our structures are simple to operate, inexpensive and easy to maintain. The rental levels are also adjusted according to local market conditions to ensure that they remain affordable. LETs designs these buildings with bioclimatic and sustainable architecture principles, first by limiting the energy expenses, such as improved daylighting, better insulation, glare and shading control, natural ventilation, sophisticated but easy to use digital systems, ecologically sound materials and construction practices, and understand them as a whole rather than in disparate parts to deliver effective solutions and address environmental concerns. Second, it is necessary to produce the energy within the building with renewable energies, such as with solar PV panels. The PV panels that we install on our facades can also act as a two-edged sword. We can use them as solar shades, but we can also use them as electricity generation. This translates to an harmonious cohabitation between the need for equipment and the respect for environmental demands. It's a doing better with a caring look on the environment, its biodiversity, and achieving equality between all people. Our flagship projects are two laboratories, two demonstrators of mastered energy concept. The first, it's a, it's a world's first energy positive office building, which are our main headquarters here in Dijon. They were completed in 2009. It's a surface area of, of about 5,000 square meters and around 562 square meters of photovoltaic panels installed on the roof, around 342 panels. It's a world's first, which continues to outperform the industry regulatory requirements and renowned environmental standards and certifications. The second project, it's our world's first energy positive residential building which is based in Strasbourg and called the Danube Tower. As I said, it's a residential building. We launched a successful architecture competition back in 2013. We broke ground in 2015. We completed it in 2018 in the city of Strasbourg. It has around a surface living, uh, a surface living of around 3,400 square meters with an office space in the bottom, around 16 stories plus a technical floor. 63 apartment units, and we enhanced the original concept model that I just showed and overachieved the results. We've been operating this building for the past three years with remarkable satisfactory results, which have surpassed the initial calculation that our engineers completed, along with existing European norms and regulations. Both projects that I just showed were built at market construction costs compared to similar standard buildings. Our design methodology is that we have deployed a new real estate model. Similar to what, El, to what Thierry just mentioned, we have the engineering arm and the real estate development, all from an upstream perspective. Architects and engineers should anticipate societal needs. They, leave their comfort, they should leave their comfort zone and go towards the unknown. They have the power to act for the greater good. At Elitis, we request the architects and the engineers to first seek for creativity and imagination before just solving a problem. That's our DNA, that's constant innovation. Our projects are also focused in customers, in the residents. Our buildings are more than just a living space. They are truly considered for what they need, the users. A space that offers amenities, flexibilities, and scalability. The human element also plays a key role in our designs as we engage in partnerships with residents, making them an ally in managing their own climate in their homes to cut their household costs and creating a sense of belonging and meaningful community, which is enhanced by the communal meeting space we call the social heart. 
When users are actively engaged, they immediately become excited. And if they come, become excited, they are more productive and enhance their community and create, create this link of sharing. The building's responsive technologies interweave with the human experience. All residents are connected to our smart home app, which is a digital nudging system that enables them to keep an overview of their energy consumption. It provide them, provides them a remote full home automation system and through a digital assistant, we encourage them to, uh, for a sustainable home management. LETs rewards those proactive and eco engagements and eco behaviors with an annual bonus, which they are encouraged to spend in their local community to support neighborhood businesses. So the circular economy. We created a world's first in sustainable construction, which integrates the environmental and the societal, the E and the S in ESG. Living in a building with extraordinary ecological and environmental performance does not mean compromising on comfort or interior design. LED's designs offer generous spaces, as I mentioned, and high quality of fittings. This is rarely achieved in affordable rental accommodation, all aimed at contributing to the well being of the individual. Our projects respond to an affordable, stable, decent, and ecological housing demand. Our projects are sustainable, ecological, affordable, scalable, resilient, and socially responsible. The whole design and construction process is aimed at reducing the environmental footprint of the building from the optimization of the land use to the minimization of the volumes the materials are needed, reducing both construction and operational costs and substantially reducing carbon emissions. We're past, we're past the point of looking for answers in the same old places. The temperatures earth is continuing to rise. The world is desperate for action on climate. Atmospheric carbon levels continue to climb, triggering increased incidents on extreme weather, environmental catastrophe, and political and societal upheaval. At Elitis, we engage in converting the built environment from a carbon source to a carbon sink, pushing us to constantly innovate and create positive impact on our neighboring communities. No investing in our future is simply the worst place to cut corners. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Elitis team. Thank you, Thierry Biev. So how we will live in the future, uh, answering to this, to this theme. And for our next speaker, we are remaining in the term of, in the realm of residence, but we are going back into nature. So our next speaker is Olivier Schutt, uh, who developed housing modules uh, for hard to access, in this case, tropical locations. Uh, a few words on Olivier. After working globally renowned office, offices, such as Eisenman Architects and OMA, uh, he became research counterpart for advanced media operations. Uh, Olivier co-founded the interdisciplinary think tank AO1, and together with a Dutch anthropologist, Marie van der Litte Jude, developed the project they will present to us now. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you to the Zueka Project Space for having us in this exhibition. Uh, we think it's very exciting to see these different interpretations of sustainable and also regenerative development. And um, well, we are based here in Costa Rica. You see me sitting in front of our office, basically. So it's a very kind of open environment that also surfaces in the project that I'm about to show. Uh, let me share my screen. Is that coming across? Great. So uh, we have a commercial entity, which is called A Company, and a non-profit part, which is called A Foundation. And with these two vehicles, we work, uh, we basically work as an interdisciplinary office for urban and rural development. And we work on the implementation of innovative sustainability at different scales. And this kind of scale difference is really important for us. And that's what I want to come across also here in this presentation today. 
In 2010, one of the earlier projects we did was a collaboration with the Office for Metropolitan Architecture in Rotterdam, where I worked before coming to Costa Rica. And we developed this idea of a roadmap to carbon neutrality in all of Costa Rica. How can we basically decarbonize the whole country from 2010 to 2021? It was a very bold and a very ambitious move, which obviously was not implemented as such right away, but it kept on being discussed in different legislation periods here of Costa Rica, the Costa Rican government. And it was this gentleman here on the left, Carlos Alvarado Quesada, the current president, who finally implemented a decarbonization plan in 2019. Uh, it's now called the Decarbonization Plan of Costa Rica, and uh, it's targeting carbon neutrality until 2050. It includes the further development of renewable energy. At this point, Costa Rica is, has produced uh, its energy household for five years consecutively with almost 100%. It's like between 99 and 100%. And we find this is an incredible achievement for a country uh, that size. And uh, in the roadmap, we also propose different kind of down phasing potentials for the different sectors that are the main contributors to carbon uh, emissions in Costa Rica, like transport industry, agriculture and other and archi agri uh, architecture, building, the building sector, of course. So the no footprint house that we also present in this record project space is our response to this roadmap. And it basically shows how we can down phase uh, carbon emissions completely within a roadmap that we have created for the project. And um, right now we're at a stage where we develop this prototype, which uh, reduces emissions 40% compared to what we call the base case. And I'm gonna explain quickly how we did that. So you basically look at the structural system that is all modular system design. We combine that with what we call the furniture plugs in order to give a big kind of variation possibility for the client to configure the home. We designed these pre, uh, we have made these pre-designed typologies, which we call the NFH 36, the 81, and the 108, which basically responds to the structural grid size. And the 108 is what we developed as a prototype. Uh, that's this building over here. It's a very compact form and it can open up to its environment, which is a very important feature of tropical architecture. A key element in the building was the development of these facade mechanisms. Here you see some early sketches, how they operate and how they can also activate this double layered facade of the vertical structural columns, which you see on the left, and the inclined outer facades. This is an early image from the prefabrication plan where we tested these gates, how they can operate, how they can operate manually or motor driven, which can also be chosen by the client. And then we basically packed this whole building on a 40 feet trailer and shipped it down the Interamericana, the Interamerican highway that connects here to the west coast of Costa Rica and of Central America. And on site, we basically deployed the central service core, which was put on the back of the truck. And the service core includes all the machinery, the bathrooms, the kitchen unit and uh, laundry area. And this kind of compression of utilities in one compact unit enables us a very interesting level of efficiency, one in the construction of the house, but also in the usage and maintenance of the building. This is an image that was roughly taken midway down the process. You see the core being installed inside and the building was built all around it. Costa Rica has very high seismic requirements. It's a high risk earthquake zone. So the core also works as the stabilizing heart of the building as well as its functional node. And this here is an image uh, that shows the building finished and the facade gates, some sections of the facade gates being open. You see the core in the center of the building and the private spaces in the back all around it. And we're basically looking here at the social area which is created all as an open space. This is a section of the building, a cross section that shows the principles of bioclimatic architecture and how the building is developed around the core, how all the technique is put into the central unit, and then also how the building is fed from it and how the uh, spaces around it are kept as an open, plan, open floor plan configuration. Here's a detail of that uh, double layered facade, which is a very important feature of the building. Of course, the inclined outer layer protects the inner floor plan from overheating and from splashing water in case of rain. And here you see a corner detail with a human scale that 
that gives you maybe an impression uh, of this kind of like ability of the building to open up to the outside and to merge these spaces uh, from outside and inside as one single entity. This year is the same corner basically from the outside. And this year on the right side is one of the sleeping rooms, uh, the private rooms, the master bedroom in this case, which we call the cocoons also. You see there's, a, there's different layers of protection. We have uh, sliding glass doors to create privacy. There's curtains also to enhance privacy. And the upper section of the building is kept open to uh, maintain the airflow at all times. Here's some impressions of the building. Uh, going around it and looking at it from the top. And this here's a summary of the different components that we used to configure this first prototype, which is the NFH 108. Uh, in the end, uh, you're looking at a 150 square meter building, which has cost around $150,000 in construction. And these thousand dollars per square meter is a very good middle price class here in Costa Rica. So that was also a goal for us to make this kind of idea of sustainable construction affordable in order to cater for a broad customer segment. I'm gonna show you a little video of the house to see how it's inhabited. And this was actually the original owners of the building who were so kind to work as our models. Yeah, I did share the audio, but I think it's better to let it run through. I understand that the audio doesn't show in the Zoom, but like here you basically see how do people use it, different times of the day. how they change the atmosphere by opening or closing the facade gates and how the building also creates this really this merging of inside and outside, which is a key feature of tropical architecture. And obviously the prototype for us has been a very important tool to see what we can improve. How are we doing with the performance of the building in terms of environmental footprint? And how can we also stimulate the inclusion of new materials that maybe don't yet exist? Because when we did the prototype for us, it was the goal to make a building that can be done with what is available in the country. Like we wanted to avoid of shipping uh, new materials to the country, but really use what is at hand. And as I said before, like with that kind of material available, we lowered the carbon emissions 40%, which means we still have a 60% footprint. And based on a life cycle assessment that we presented at the 2019 conferences for climate change from the United Nations, uh, we showed that with a development of materials that can be grown sustainably in Costa Rica, we can basically bring this performance down to 20% of remaining footprint. And these last 20% we compensate by the production of solar energy top of the building. So the building that you saw over here that basically has a connection to the public grid because of the renewable capacity of the public grid here in Costa Rica. And we only heat water locally with solar, with a thermo solar collector. And like we saw that for off-grid locations, we can also provide the building basically with a 20 square meter set of photovoltaic panels, which makes the building completely independent. And what's next? I already mentioned that we developed this wood system together with a Swiss Costa Rican company called Novel T. And we're now in the making of the first prototype, basically, of this wooden building, which was auto-configured by the clients. So they basically created a 21 by 9 meter floor plan. It will be put on this site that you see here on the left, hovering over a bay called uh, Whale Tail Bay. And uh, this building is expected to be 
finished by the end of this year. And at the same time, we also got into reproducing the pre-designed typologies that I presented earlier here in this talk. So that's our roadmap to go with this project. And we're also working on urban configurations, which is very exciting. And uh, if you want to see more about our work, you can find it via this direction. And I'm looking forward to the shared discussion now. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Oliver. And uh, we thank you to all the speakers. It was really great uh, presentations. Uh, we're here with Alessandro. I think we're very happy because we wanted to gather uh, today in Venice uh, different people that have, I think have one thing in common is that they they put into action uh, some some dreams in order to to, to provoke some change, and uh, I was happy to hear also like uh, Thierry Biev was say, stating about how to make a difference by pushing the boundaries and, and trying uh, trying to convince with uh, innovation and new ideas. So it leads us to to uh, the next uh, the next part of uh, our meeting is uh, about uh, how. Uh, we've seen that everyone has, uh, has prove, proven through those presentations that it's possible actually to move the lines uh, in order to, to create those, uh, those buildings or uh, those new developments that you just showed. So we'll, we'd like to open uh, the floor to, uh, to some open questions, maybe starting with uh, Cédric, uh, sitting with, here with me in Venice, which is a, a very uh, strong honor. Uh, the question is, is, very, um, is very free and, and, and easy, is that what did we all learn from uh, what we've shown and what we've, we've, we've tried and, and, and what are the next steps, like o uh, Oliver was already uh, starting to, to answer that question, is about what are we facing as a, as a future challenge and uh, what did we learn that we would like to improve in the, in the future? Yes. Uh, at the first time the challenge is to uh, realize what, uh, what the simulation says about the project, so uh, at, at this time we, we know that we are uh, able to um, maintain uh, this um, about 26 degrees during um, uh, seven months uh, without uh, um, another energy. Um, and uh, we, we, we must, we must uh, uh, build this greenhouse for to, to show that today it's possible. That's it's the first challenge. And, um, and the next step is, uh, it's, uh, of course, to uh, develop this sort of technology in the future. And um, we know that uh, today that it's possible, we think it's possible to, um, uh, to, to in, in a big, on another project that, uh, for example, we have um, um, in the uh, center of the, of the, of the towns or streets or we, we can um, we can do in the future many things about this uh, this sort of of, uh, uh, of recycling energy and um, so two steps and uh, another step I don't know exactly in the future but um, the challenge is important today and um, we, we we hope to start constructions next year and um, it's a, it's a really a really big project and uh, the challenge is, is really high. Yeah, it's important to say that uh, for this dome, every um, construction drawings have been made and, and uh, we have uh, uh, obtained all the legal authorizations. Yes. So now uh, everybody is very excited mm. to, to bring it to, to reality and to life, uh, which is a huge challenge because the project is mm. important, is, uh, is big, as, as you were saying, it's like the, maybe the first. Uh, and I have uh, for forgotten that to say um, the another, another um, um, heat for, for this system during winter, for example, uh, is uh, completed by uh, geothermy. Uh, and uh, uh, at this time, we have made uh, the first, um, the the first uh, test for to show that um, the, the water in the ground can be um, uh, put some calories inside the greenhouse during the winter. And at this time, we, we know that it's possible. And um, it's the first it's a fir the this first thing is a, it's a good for the future because uh, we know that today it's possible to to build this fantastic greenhouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, the beginning of a new new uh, possibilities actually. Uh, it's uh, even thinking about uh, as you were just saying, large infrastructure, uh, which whether whereas they are urban infrastructure or in an open landscape, 
uh, we can think and design uh, places with some uh, uh, innovations where energy savings mm -hmm. is uh, is uh, coming back to the idea of uh, zero uh, impact. On and, uh, it's it's important for me to um, to thank you for this project because. Um, we have um, today we have a sort of identity of this project. It's not a, a, a cube uh, like we, we can show um, many in, in the world. You 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 said what is a greenhouse? A greenhouse it's a, it's most of the time cubic, uh, without um, a spirit. And now we have a, um, a specific tr structure. And in our country, when you say Tropicalia, you have um, immediately this, this um, image of this dome. And so we have now an identity, and that um, uh, identity is made by the architect, your, your, your work, and um, it's important for, for us. And thanks for, for this, because um, uh, it's import arch architecture is really important in this sort of project. Yes, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, it's important to say that uh, every presentation today is showing that uh, uh, all those projects are really site specific related to their climate and uh, uh, according to um, to those conditions that are often more like constraints or uh, actually if with good thinking and uh, energy it is possible to design uh, objects that are not only functional but also objects that are really taking place and shape into an environment to bring uh, also what everybody needs is uh, uh, adding uh, infrastructure that are connecting with their environment. Uh, so thank you, uh, Cedric. Maybe uh, we just have the same question for everyone. It's, uh, it's really opening up to the, to the future. Like we've, we've all been talking about our current work and what, been, what we have been experiencing. And it's also, uh, I don't know if, uh, Philip, uh, you see uh, how do you see the future in lightweight structure in order to promote uh, this, uh, what you presented is uh, making the balance between the architecture, the, the technology and uh, the shape of uh, the building. Uh, what do you have in, uh, in your hands in order to, uh, uh, to make it happen? Uh, I think you, you, you're working with uh, new materials, uh, you're working with uh, improving uh, capacity to, to bear loads and to to, to, to make uh, even uh, everyday lighter lighter buildings so that their, their footprint is also lighter in the environment. Do, do you have anything uh, you want to share about this? Yeah, I think there's an engineering drive, um, you know, in innovation. But I think I think what this project, you know, it, it's taken a, a bit of time in the last uh, the last few months, but the reflection only helps to define, you know, I think the point is the integration of not just the structure, but the, the cavity, you know, is what makes this this dome work so well, and how the structure and the, you know, the, the airflow and, and, and the purpose of that cavity. I mean, it's all of a sudden on this project, the structure has a purpose um, with these two or three meter high trusses to contain the air and circulate the air and um, recycle the air. And I think if there's anything that, you know, that, that interests me personally and certainly the team we have isn't so much in the materials, but it's more in the integration. You know how, how you can can make our materials and, and the geometry um, and, and the shapes um, integrate um, the environmental function. You know, is it air circulating? Um, you know, capturing capturing the, the sun's performance, insulating it somehow, cooling it somehow. Um, I think we need to, as engineers and certainly structural engineers, um, to be a lot more dedicated to that. Um, you know, drive, have a, have a stronger drive for that. Um, so less, less technology in the sense of light, light, uh, find something that is, you know, is, is pure of lightweight form, but actually, you know, going beyond the boundaries of, of the environmental side. Um, and I think, I think certainly that's, you know, we just um, appointed somebody in our team in Paris um, who has a, a, a full-time role in uh, sustainability, um, just just doing that sustainability of structures, sustainability of facades, you know, full time, and 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 basically treading into other areas, into into the environmental areas, and and basically, you know, uh, taking all that information that others have and 
some people maybe don't look for so 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 far and and bring it and integrate it into the structure and the facades i think that's that that's what's going to happen next yeah thanks philip uh maybe morgan uh just a few words about uh, novaxia action i think uh, what you, you've been presenting is, is the work we, we do together on the Wonder Building is, uh, uh, is of course an amazing uh, challenge to uh, bring to life a new type of uh, office space. We also know an Avaxia agenda about uh, making progress on uh, recycling uh, places. And uh, in the meantime, I think we were uh, working on this uh, new project, uh, which is not only uh, a new office building, but it's also uh, as you mentioned, uh, regeneration of uh, districts in uh, in uh, in Bagnolet, which is uh, which is a really good and strong action for the next uh, neighbors to come. I think uh, Novaxia, in the same time, is also thinking and also has been influenced, I guess, by um, the, the 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 current situation of uh, the way of working tomorrow and uh, uh, the change of. Uh, uh, typologies of buildings. I know that Novaxia is very active into you now transforming uh, existing office spaces into uh, housings. Actually, that's what I, I read quite a lot in the in the press. So, do you want to say a few words about also uh, what are the next steps for Novaxia? Yes. Well, I think the the the, the future is uh, our main driver is uh, to to try to reconcile because we think it's possible. Uh, the meaning of what we are doing and, and the profitability, because we think that one cannot go uh, in a, a virtuous way uh, without the other, uh, as we are partly an investment company and partly a developer company. So we try to uh, make uh, uh, to align interests, and uh, at each and every step, um, we, we we try to uh, to focus of what we can do uh, on the ESG. Uh, perspective. So uh, I was uh, saying that uh, urbanism, uh, temporary urbanism is one of them. Um, uh, when we can uh, re refurbish and renovate and not destroy uh, we, we, and transform, we, we, we do it uh, because it's less uh, carbon footprint. Um, when, uh, of course, uh, we, we try to be 100% uh, um, uh, Zen, uh, which is um, a net zero land uh, conversion real estate. So uh, in order not to, uh, uh, to preserve uh, biodiversity and uh, natural spaces. Uh, uh, so there are like these this few, few points and it's true that uh, uh, Novaxia is today uh, uh, facing and uh, addressing the issue of uh, residential, uh, especially in uh, dense uh, and tense uh, areas uh, such as uh, in the France, uh, uh, and, and, and big cities uh, in France. And uh, one, uh, one thing that we actually uh, was the first, uh, the first operation at Novaxia in 2006, uh, when, uh, when, when Joachim Mazan, its founder, uh, started, uh, was to transform um, some vacant office space, old office spaces in Strasbourg, in La Petite France, uh, into some residential. And it worked, and, and it just, so he said himself, okay, let, there is something here uh, we, need to, uh, we need to investigate and, and dig. So that's what we did. And it's true that uh, uh, we see a kind of alignment of planets uh, where you have still uh, some lack uh, into ho of housing uh, first. Uh, so the, 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 the demand is very strong and the pandemic didn't help uh, because uh, the numbers of uh, new housing on the market have decreased uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and then there is uh, uh, the new ways of working, and so the office spaces are being reduced most of the time by the companies, and there is still all this stock of old offices that are not now used to uh, the new ways of working. Uh, in, uh, in Wonder Building, for instance, uh, we had uh, like between 10 and 15 percent of spaces dedicated to uh, meeting rooms, and after the pandemic, we worked uh, with Goldefi, with uh, um, with Brick, in order to uh, to to put the to to make this figure goes up to 20 percent of meeting spaces dedicated of uh, yes of uh, spaces dedicated to meeting meeting rooms because we think that tomorrow well today already and tomorrow uh, when when you go to the office and when you don't do home office 
It's because you want to be you, you want to be with people, so you want to uh, uh, interact, you want to collaborate. So you need more uh, hybrid and meeting rooms. So so we are trying to take into account all of that. And it's true that uh, looking at the stock and the the, the scarcity of space available, uh, then the idea is to say, okay, there is there must be something to do and to uh, transform offices into residential might be one of the solutions that must be uh, uh, studied uh, in order to face and to provide some new housing for, for people. So we have a few projects. Uh, one of them were, was uh, uh, inaugurated uh, um, in uh, last year, uh, beginning of 2000, well, not last year, beginning of 2021, sorry, um, in, uh, in Paris, uh, 19th arrondissement. Uh, and uh, it's uh, 38, uh, like a building, uh, Art Deco, uh, very nice one that we fully renovated. Plus we added uh, three extra levels. So there is a kind of modernity and uh, um, old, old style of the 1930s, the facade that we, uh, we kept entirely. And, um, and actually the 38 uh, uh, apartments were, were all well sold uh, to, uh, uh, to new owners uh, that like actually to have uh, the story of what it was before and to, to know that they somehow participate in the in heritage of uh, what was the city before. Thank you, Thank you Morgan. Thank you, Morgan. So um, uh, maybe Thierry and uh, Alan, uh, just a simple question. Since you started, uh, uh, when you started your first project, I think it was in Dijon. Uh, do you remember, uh, I mean, do you, uh, do you see uh, the problems you have solved since, since you started this project and the new ones you are, you are operating now? And, uh, and what are the lessons you've learned from those projects in order to, uh, to put the new in action uh, for, the next, for the next projects? So, um, Thomas, um, I think it's not a question of uh, technology. It's not a, a question of uh, raw materials. Uh, it's um, uh, issue. It's not an issue also uh, of energy, um, because I, I think uh, during uh, our first uh, world first uh, uh, um, project, uh, we have um, discovered uh, the new the new energy and. Uh, uh, each one uh, uh, have a lot of the, this energy. Uh, and we think uh, at Elitis that the, the energy of the future is the brain power, and uh, we have to, uh, um, to uh, all together to, to, to work to, uh, uh, to have a multidisciplinary um, uh, ambition uh, with uh, architects, uh, psychologists, uh, engineers. Uh, and, and so on uh, and to um, uh, to um, give the, um, the the possibilities to the, the next generation to uh, to live uh, on the same planet of us as an us and uh, uh, we think uh, um, that uh, um, low tech enfin, we 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 listen, enfin, we on apprend nous avons appris we listen, uh, we learn we learn uh, um, in our um, two uh, first experiences. Uh, that uh, um, uh, we have uh, a lot of solutions uh, um, today uh, with uh, low tech uh, and uh, uh, when we had um, uh, digital technology, uh, you could uh, um, uh, work together with uh, tenants and uh, users of your buildings and they, they um, come with, uh, with uh, the property managers, with the asset managers to, uh, to give the, the best results that you, you can um, uh, expect. Do you want to add uh, something? Yeah, I, I, I think also the uh, big advantage that we had is that at that time when we built our projects, having been the first ones to build an energy positive office building and then a residential building uh, makes us that the competition that we have is with ourselves. So basically we, we will take what we've learned and we apply that to build or to design the new building. So that, uh, the competition is just with ourselves for the future projects. Thank you. Uh, so I think maybe um, uh, last question to Oliver. Uh, also, maybe it's a good uh, conclusion with, uh, with the theme of architecture, which is here at the Architecture Biennale. 
because uh, both of us are architects and uh, those challenges that we have been facing or as architects uh, and, and the, the project you explained and you just showed to us, um, do you see uh, any more opportunities in the future to, uh, to, to promote those type of projects? Uh, and and what, what you just started to, to talk about the next steps, but uh, as, as, the pro as the profession of architects, uh, how, do, how do we stand today uh, with those realities and the, the capacity we have to, to convince different stakeholders? Uh, do you have a view on that? Yeah, definitely, and it's a great question. Thank you for that one. Because, let's say, I think there are two points that I also said a little bit at the beginning of my presentation, and they are the crucial points to respond to your question. One is interdisciplinarity, and one is to look at different scales at the same time. So the no footprint house is like the architectural expression of our search or our work on what we call integral sustainability. And this integral sustainability, we also speak about the four E's, which respond to the more classic kind of uh, pillars of sustainable development, the environment, economy, and equity, in terms of social equity. And we combine it with the fourth E, which is engineering. So these are the kind of main areas that we look at and that we combine in the different projects that we work on. And I think when we look at something like the No Footprint House or the scale of the No Footprint House, it's always important to remember how it's coming out of the bigger scale. In that case, uh, for example, the roadmap to carbon neutrality at national level here in Costa Rica. And I think we need to understand really how all the things are intertwined and how they connect and how the building industry is part of a bigger whole. Uh, I was briefly, quickly using the simple example of do we connect an Ophelpen House prototype in Ophelchal to the local public power grid, or do we import solar panels from China and the US or Europe? I think these are all questions that we need to look at. And Costa Rica is not a high-tech country, so for us it was also important to create this kind of appropriate technology approach or response to the idea of sustainable development. And now that we had a certain kind of, you know, outreach with that project, it was much communicated over here, also actually worldwide. And um, it's opening up interesting discussions and portals for us. So on the one hand side, of course, we intend to optimize the building as such, which is a pre-standing typology. But we also want to get into suburban and urban areas. So we have different uh, projects now where we look at uh, what we call the no footprint community, where obviously it's very interesting to see how we can maximize uh, the production of uh, local, locally produced energy, and also how we can uh, create a wastewater treatment that responds to several units at the same time. And this is very important here for coastal zones where we work in order to bring different kind of no footprint houses together in what we call the no footprint community. And then Costa Rica is a very interesting laboratory for us because actually the country has 12 microclimates. So the building as I have presented it today is located in a tropical humid forest area in the Southwest of Costa Rica. But we also have tropical dry forest. We have elevations up to 4,000 meters where it can get cold, obviously. So for us to work with these different layers of the buildings and adapt the buildings to the local climate is a very interesting exercise that we're currently going through. And at the same time, we're also looking into the possibility of applying the principles of the North Open House, which is prefabrication, which is a uh, central service core, which can also be stacked, of course, and double layered facades, active facades, uh, that create different kind of living possibilities for the inhabitants and that create obviously different kind of responses to the climate. We look at how to bring that all into a more verticalized structure as well. We're working on a four-story building in Germany, also with a wood structure. And this kind of interchange between the global south, the tropics over here, and the global north, which is where I'm from originally, that is something very exciting to see also how places and projects that we do over here in Central America can inform and can ultimately influence also an architecture that we can do elsewhere, let it be North America, Europe, or elsewhere in the northern part of the planet. And at the same time, we have a lot of response for working in the global south, especially Southeast Asia and near Central America, to keep on working on the no footprint house as I presented it today. And that really provides us with a big 
uh, list of tasks and challenges for the next for the next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oliver. Thank you very much to all our speakers today. Thank you very much, Mr. Guerin. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, follow us for our next iterations. Come visit the show. We still have a month. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.